reading God's word this evening starts, or is in Psalm 19. And the word of God says this, starting in verse 7. The law of the Lord is perfect, restoring the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true. They are righteous altogether. They are more desirable than gold, yes, than much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and the drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them your servant is warned. In keeping them there is great reward. Who can discern his errors? Acquit me of hidden faults. Also keep, also keep back your servant from presumptuous sins. Let them not rule over me. Then I will be blameless, and I shall be acquitted of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. The word of God for the people of God. Remain standing as we continue to worship the Lord. Would you join me in singing, Great is Thy Faithfulness. Father in heaven, what a joy to be back in your house tonight. 
Lord, I know it gives you great pleasure when you see your family come together. And Lord, when you see your family come together when they hunger and they thirst for righteousness and they hunger and they thirst for you, when they desire to have a deeper, more intimate, personal relationship with you, because indeed, Lord, you are a faithful God. You're a God that will meet all of our needs according to your glorious riches in Christ Jesus. Lord, I pray tonight that you would increase our capacity to know you and to love you and to serve you. Lord, we give you honor. We exalt you. May your name and your word be exalted in this place above everything else. Lord, we thank you for those things we experienced this morning. We thank you for those things we've experienced on this 40-day journey, those things that only you can do. Lord, so we don't take it for granted when you speak. We're excited to see your activity. And Lord, we know that the good work that you have begun in us, you will complete Lord, we thank you that you can do more in a moment than we can do in a lifetime. So, Father, I just pray that you continue to see in us a receptive heart, that we would be willing to be made willing, that we would say, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, to whatever you desire for us to do. So, Lord, we thank you for your servant that you've brought to us tonight. We thank you for your hand upon his life. Lord, we thank you for the ways you've guided him and spoken truth into his life, Lord, and how you have prepared him for these nights with us. And Lord, we pray for our, our uh, county. Lord, we know that other churches are meeting for revival tonight. A, a group of churches, Lattimore and Beaverdam, Crestview, some of these churches that are meeting for revival. So, Lord, we just pray you do something in our county, Lord, and just help us to be a part of it. Just help us to be obedient, Lord. Uh, one moment, one day, one decision at a time. So, Lord, we love you. We thank you for the privilege to be together tonight. We surrender ourselves to you in the name of the Lord Jesus. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. So happy to see so many of you here tonight. Take a moment and greet those around you. Say hello in the name of the Lord Jesus, and thanks for being here. Say hello to your neighbor tonight. Okay, so uh, thank you so much for coming back tonight. We're happy to have you. And uh, Brandy was telling me we do have a nursery tonight, and we have a nursery throughout the revival, if uh, that can be of any assistance to you. But I did want to take just a moment uh, to see if one or two of you wanted to share, because this is an ongoing process as God continues to grow us into his likeness. And we've talked about these five prayers I'm just wondering tonight if there'd be somebody who'd be willing to share of those five prayers, which one was the hardest one for you to pray and deal with? Lord, search me was the first one, right? Lord, search me. Lord, break me. Lord, stretch me. Lord, lead me. And Lord, use me. Of those five, would somebody be willing to share and just say, you know what? I've never prayed that prayer before and it really challenged me as... Anybody be willing to give a quick little word of testimony about those five prayers and how God used them uh, in your life? I know this is intimidating. You say, we got people in here, I don't know who they are, but we know who he is. Amen? Amen. Anybody want to open up? 
Be authentic. Be real. You know, that's what the church is all about. Being honest and being real. All right. Yes, brother. Thank you. Felt, hey. <laughs> I don't know how to respond to that one. <laughs> Um, uh, honestly, like all of them were tough for me, uh, but if you're really reflecting on who you are, then you know it's bad. But the first one really search me, um, going through discipleship with, uh, Barry Coker at this time. And, you know, one of the things that we're trying to, to drill in is the fact that God knows you and he loves you the way you are, right? Like doesn't mean he wants to leave you where you're at. But he loves you the way you are. And sometimes the hardest part of a Christian's walk is really coming to understand that God does love them. And see, springing forth from that love is everything else. And so, um, you know, but it's hard sometimes to get honest with yourself. God, like I know how bad I am. But you know this too, Lord, and you still love me and you want to use me and work through me. So. You may have felt sorry for me, brother, but that word needed to be said tonight. That's a good word. There's nothing you can do that would make God love you any more. Nothing you have done that will make God love you any less. Amen. Anybody else before we uh, turn it back over to some special music? Yes. Which one was the hardest one for you, Jessica? But I'm not... Again, not much of a speaker, but I do know the um, break me and stretch me was the most difficult. And I think it really took place more as I was at work in the work setting. And it, um, I'm just thankful, too, that as I'm working that I remind myself, or the Holy Spirit does, that I'm a light in a dark world for him. And, you know, I have to be a representative on his behalf. And it's not always easy, you know, biting that tongue, you know, yeah. and keeping those thoughts in check. But, um, yeah, we've been struggling. Um, battlefield starts in the mind. And just take captive every thought that comes in to discern what, where it's coming from. And stay in the word because the word is what's going to tell you, you know, you know, faith comes by hearing and reading the word, you know. Yeah. So um, just stay in the Word. That's what I know. <laughs> What's on your mind, Jay? Love the Lord. I, I love the Lord. Then was um, love for me, in my, in my, in my, in my heart. All the time, um, I had a job today. I did. I did a lot of bar all the time in the house. I did um, my girl, Jeever, she had to get in my house. She gets out of my house. She, she gets out her. She said it. Well, I told her she is, she is, uh, I'm going to be with Anna today. I meet her. And one last thing I do want to say real quick. I had a moment where someone, it, it more or less shocked me when they asked, um, how do you know God exists? And I said, well, I said, God is love. I said, I'm love. I have shown you love said, so therefore I know God exists if he lives in me. So that was one way of testifying innocence and using. All right, you we love both of you guys. Say amen. Amen. Glad you're in the Lord's house tonight. We uh, are blessed to have some special music tonight uh, at this time. Uh, note we're going to sing a chorus first, it looks like. I don't have my glasses on. I'm doing the best I can. Uh, open our eyes. Lord, let this be your prayer tonight. Uh, open, open your eyes. So uh, Dana, lead us in this.
I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. He shall dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and Almighty God will be with them. shall wipe away all tears from their eyes there shall be no more death neither sorrow nor crying and no more pain the former things are all passed away he that sat upon the throne said behold I make all things new. He said unto me, Write these words, for they are faithful and true. And it is done. It is done. Son of God, the King of kings, Lord of lords, He's everything, Messiah, Jehovah, the Prince of Peace is He. The Son of Man, Seed of Abraham, second person in the Trinity, He is the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. The Son of God, the King of kings, Lord of lords, he's everything, Messiah, Jehovah, the Prince of Peace is he. The Son of Man, Seed of Abraham, second person in the Trinity. He is the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. The Son of God, the King of kings, Lord of lords, he's everything, Messiah. Jehovah, the Prince of Peace is He. The Son of Man, Seed of Abraham, second person in the Trinity. He is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. The Son of God, the King of Kings, Lord of Lords, He's everything. Messiah, Jehovah, the Prince of Peace is He. The Son of Man, Seed of Abraham, second person in the Trinity, He is the Alpha and Omega, the Son of God, the King of Kings, the Messiah, Jehovah, the Great I Am, Seed of And Omega, the beginning and the end, Son of God, King of Kings, the Lord of everything, He is Lord.
choirs finding their seats, would you pray with me? Father, we just uh, come before you, Lord, thanking you for the power of your presence. Lord, I know that song touched many hearts tonight. I know there are those that are dealing with great grief, those that are dealing with loneliness, those who have been betrayed and rejected and wounded even by family members here tonight. But Father, we thank you for the peace of your presence, Lord, when we draw near to you. Lord, just pray for the ministry of your Holy Spirit to every need in this place tonight. Lord, we know your word says, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but you deliver them out of them all. So Lord, there's nothing better that we can do tonight than to seek your face and to seek you with all our hearts, and to hear from you. So anoint your servant as he comes to open up the word of life to us, that we might have ears to hear and a heart to obey. We humbly ask and pray in the name of King Jesus. Amen. Thank you so much, choir. Annabelle. Uh, I'd like to introduce to you our uh, speaker tonight, president of uh, Fruitland Bible College, uh, Dr. David Horton. He uh, is from uh, Hillsville, Virginia, and uh, he met his wife, Lisa, at a revival, 
I understand maybe your father was a pastor, and so uh, a lot of their dates involve church, and what a great atmosphere to grow. Been married about 44 years, I think. Uh, three grown children, seven grandchildren, and they passed the test this weekend. I think they got to keep for the first time your two-year-old this past week, and uh, things went okay. So if you're dragging a little bit tonight, we'll understand. But he's been the president at Fruitland for 15 years, and of course, I can't think of Fruitland Bible College without thinking of my father-in-law, Dr. Paul Sorrells, who uh, taught English there for many years, and so uh, Paul... And uh, David had a wonderful working relationship, and I know you, you greatly miss him, as we all do. But please welcome to the pulpit tonight, uh, Dr. David Horton. Thank you so much. Amen. Well, thank you so much, Pastor Tim. It is a joy to be here with you all. I thank God for the opportunity to be a part of this revival. I know that God has already been meeting with you, sending revival into your lives, and I am thrilled at what God is doing. I'm absolutely thrilled by that. I've been praying along with you during the 40 days leading up to revival, going through the book, returning to holiness, and God has been very much at work in my life during that process as well. And a lot of the message that I'm going to preach tonight uh, comes uh, out of that experience. But it's good to see all of you here tonight. I've got to point out one person very special to me, in addition to my wife, Lisa, of course. Um, but uh, a man is here tonight, a man of God, Jim Brackett, that has pastored a number of churches through the years. He's been a spiritual mentor to me. And uh, the Lord allowed us to uh, spend some time together up at Fruitland a few weeks ago with that we really enjoyed. But uh, this man, probably more than any other person that I can think of, has impacted my life spiritually by his own life and the investment that he has made in me uh, through the years. And I thank God so much for him. It's just good to be here tonight, be a part of this group. And uh, the message that I'm going to bring tonight is going to be from the book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 66. We're going to look at verses 1 and 2. And I've entitled the message, When God Looks Your Way. When God Looks Your Way. Now, some of you mentioned in regard to those five prayers that we're talking about a moment ago, that some of them were difficult. And some of those experiences with the Lord, especially when we're confessing sin and when we're being broken, those are some heavy experiences, aren't they? But yet revival grows out of that. And I don't want us to leave that too quickly to move on to the other aspects of revival because the people that God look at, the people that God looks upon are in this passage of Scripture and they're described here tonight. So let's think about the subject when God looks your way. And if you found your place there in the Old Testament, in the book of Isaiah, chapter 66, verses 1 and 2, if you found your place there, would you stand with me? If you're physically able to do so, would you stand with me for the reading of the word? And then for a moment of prayer. Isaiah 66, verses 1 and 2. Thus says the Lord, Heaven is my throne, and earth is my footstool. Where is the house that you will build for me? And where is the place of my rest? For all those things my hand has made. And all those things exist, says the Lord. But on this one will I look, on him who is poor and of a contrite spirit and who trembles at my word. May God bless his word tonight. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, I pray that your written word would live within our hearts tonight. 
I pray that the anointing of the Holy Spirit would be upon me as the preacher in the pulpit, but also that your anointing would be upon each person in this congregation. I pray that you would give us ears to hear and eyes to see and minds to think with and hearts that are ready to receive your word tonight. And may we act upon the things that you say to us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And you can be seated. As human beings, we enjoy looking upon God's magnificent creation. And one of the ways that we enjoy that is looking into the night sky and seeing the planets and the stars and the solar system, the universe that God has made. We're fascinated with it. That's why that when we were children, most of us had a telescope somewhere along the way, didn't we? And when we grow up to be adults and we have children of our own, we buy telescopes for them because they are also interested in looking into the night sky and seeing the vastness and the beauty of the creation that is around us. A little boy was looking through a telescope with his father and he said to his daddy, he said, Daddy, is, if heaven is this beautiful from our side, think how much more beautiful it must be from God's side. And I think he had a point there. The universe is absolutely magnificent. And the telescopes that I've just described don't even compare with the power of telescopes that have been launched into outer space that are bringing us spectacular views of the creation of God. Do you realize that the observable universe is 94 billion light years across? And notice I said the observable universe because it's all that we can see through the telescopes. There's more beyond what we can see. There's more beyond what we can even fathom. Now, in light of that, I want us to look at verse 1 again, where the Lord says, Heaven is my throne, and earth is my footstool. I believe that the rhetorical questions that are asked in verse 1 are actually meant to be somewhat humorous because the question is asked, the Lord says, where's the house that you'll build me? And where is the place of my rest? I mean, God is saying, look at where I dwell. Look at the universe that I made. This is where I am. The earth is my footstool. You're going to try to build a house for me? that I can dwell in. And I think King Solomon had it exactly right when he said in 1 Kings 8, 27, but will God indeed dwell on the earth? Behold, heaven and the heaven of heavens cannot contain you, how much less this temple that I have built. So obviously, we can't improve upon what the Lord has already made. He says, for all these things my hands have made, all these things exist, says the Lord. And so we are fascinated when we look up and we enjoy the beauty of God's creation. But what does the God who made this universe enjoy looking upon? What does God desire to see? Where does God look with favor. The last part of verse 2 in our text gives us the answer to that question because the last part of verse 2 says, but on this one will I look, on him who is poor and of a contrite spirit and who trembles at my word. I want you to see tonight in that verse that God looks with pleasure upon those who possess three qualities. There are three qualities in that verse that cause God 
to look in your direction. If you want to gain God's attention, if you want God to look upon you, then these three qualities are absolutely essential. And the preparation you've been doing for revival and the time you've spent in prayer and in the study of God's Word, I believe that God is bringing all of us to the place that the psalm, uh, where Isaiah is talking about tonight. And so I want us to see those three qualities that cause God to look in our direction. First of all, God looks upon those who have a poor disposition. He looks upon those with a poor disposition. The verse says that God looks upon him who is poor. Now, some in this room may have had the experience of growing up with economic hardships. You may have grown up poor. I was talking to a man one time. He said, we didn't even have roaches at our house because there wasn't even enough food to attract them. There was nothing left for them to be able to eat. Well, this passage of Scripture tonight is not talking about being economically poor. But this passage is talking about being spiritually poor. The word in Hebrew literally means to be without property, to be poor, to be wretched, and to be needy. And it is a description not of our economic condition, but it is a description of our spiritual condition before the Lord. Now, the Puritan pastor, Thomas Watson, uh, had something to say about this. And by the way, I'm probably going to quote several Puritans in the message tonight because in my estimation, out of all those who have lived since biblical times until today, I think the Puritans probably had the greatest concept on what this verse is saying to us tonight and the right kind of heart that God looks upon. But the Puritan pastor, Thomas Watson, he said this, poverty of spirit is a kind of self-annihilation. Watson knew that the only way to get right with God is to abandon every iota of trust that you would have in your own self or in anything that you might offer God. And you find yourself flinging yourself upon the mercy of Almighty God. I think the hymn, Rock of Ages, the third verse, captured that thought well. The word says, nothing in my hand I bring. Simply to the cross I cling. Naked come to thee for dress. Helpless look to thee for grace. Foul I to the fountain fly. Wash me, Savior, or I die. So what does this poor disposition look like? You remember the story, the parable that Jesus told about the Pharisee and the tax collector who went into the temple to pray? The, the Pharisee goes into the temple and he stands there before the Lord and he begins to brag on himself before the Lord. You know, any time we come before God and we brag on ourselves, we're in trouble right off the bat, aren't we? Because we don't have this poor disposition that the Scripture is teaching us to have. And so the Pharisee prays and he brags on himself to God. It's as though the man is trying to impress God. And he says, Lord, I thank you that I'm not like other men are. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of everything that I possess. And he's really implying, I'm not like this old tax collector over here. I'm different than he is. But then we see the tax collector begins to pray. And he beats up on his chest a sign of distress. And he says, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. 
And Jesus says that this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. That's what it looks like to have a poor disposition before the Lord. Jeremy Taylor was an Anglican bishop and writer in the 1600s, and he wrote these words. He said, Christianity has its most glorious effect on your heart when it has changed your spirit, removed all the pride of life from you, and made you delight in humbling yourselves beneath the lowest of all your fellow creatures. So tonight, I want to say to you that there's great hope for you if you come before the Lord with a poor disposition Jesus said blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven if through the process of praying for this revival and studying and preparing your heart for revival if you have a poor disposition that you bring into the presence of God if you feel your poverty stricken condition before the Lord you are in a great place right now because God is looking your way and the kingdom of heaven is in your view God looks upon those with a poor disposition. But secondly, the second quality that the scripture tells us about, God looks upon the person who has a contrite spirit. He looks upon those who have a contrite spirit. The word contrite in Hebrew means broken and in need of repair. It means to be lamed or to be disabled. God is drawn toward the person who recognizes that he or she is spiritually broken and disabled by sin to the extent that they are unable to stand upright before God. It's what the psalmist was talking about in Psalm 34 and in verse 18. He says, and the Lord is near to those who have a broken heart and save such as have a contrite spirit. You remember David's prayer of confession in Psalm 51. After he had sinned so horribly, he comes before the Lord. And in this prayer, he says, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. Now, often in revival, those are the things we want to avoid and, and we want to move past those things and, and we say, God, I, I want revival. I want the joy. I want the peace. I want the power of the Holy Spirit to be upon my life. I want to see God move in a powerful and a dramatic way. But it must happen first when we bring before God that contrite heart. We don't need to move too quickly past that point. Charles Simeon was a leader in uh, the UK evangelical revival around the turn of the 18th and 19th centuries. And I want you to listen to what this great man of God says about brokenness. He says, there are none on earth so pleasing to God as broken-hearted sinners. Their sighs and groans are as music in his ears. Their tears he treasures up in his vial. He dwells with them as his dearest friends. He rejoices over them as a people in whom he greatly delights. He saves them here by the unceasing exercise of his power and reserves for them hereafter an inheritance in heaven. If you have a broken and a contrite spirit, that ought to encourage you. God seems to love broken things. God can't do very much with us 
until we get broken. When you think about it, that's how we have to come to the Lord for salvation in the beginning, isn't it? Uh, we can't come before God bragging on how good we are and, and what a good deal that the Lord is getting because we are now coming into his family. We don't come to God like that, do we? We come in brokenness and confession and in neediness before the Lord. That's how the Christian life begins. But listen to me, brothers and sisters. That is also how the Christian life continues. That's how it continues, is having that contrite spirit before the Lord. God loves broken things. Think about these examples. To enjoy the fragrance of a perfume or a cologne, you have to break the seal of the container in which it is in. To see a plant rise from the ground, the shell of that seed must be broken open by the substance inside. If you enjoy roasted peanuts like I do, uh, the roasted peanut, there must be a breaking of its outer core. For a baby chick to be born and experience life, it must break the egg that surrounds it. And if you want to see God's face looking toward you, we've got to be broken first. The most powerful moments in our lives happen when we come before God broken and humbled and we allow God to pick up the broken pieces and to put our lives back together again. Jesus said, blessed are those who mourn for they shall be comforted. These are the ones that will be comforted. If you're mourning over your spiritual brokenness and over your sin, let me encourage you tonight by saying you have captured God's attention. He is looking straight at you. He sees you when you come before him with a contrite spirit. But this passage mentions a third quality that is absolutely essential as well. And that third quality that causes God to look our way is when we come before God with a trembling heart. A trembling heart. The Lord says he looks upon the person who trembles at his word. There at the end of verse number 2. Now, we don't hear much about this concept of trembling before the Lord today. I think that the whole concept of the fear of God is one that we don't like to think about or consider very much. And when we do talk about it, we describe the fear of God as being reverence and awe of God. But there's another dimension to fearing God that we dare not overlook, and it involves trembling in the presence of a holy God. Now, we don't hear much about that. We don't think much about that. But the Bible sure does speak about it. In the book of Ezra, in chapter 9 and verse number 4, it says, Then everyone who trembled at the words of the God of Israel assembled to me because of the transgression of those who had been carried away captive, and I sat astonished until the evening sacrifice. They trembled at the word of the Lord. And then in Psalm 119, that great psalm that is all about the word of God. In Psalm 119, verse 20, the scripture says, my flesh trembles for fear of you, and I am afraid of your judgments. And then I also love the Old Testament book of Habakkuk and the response of Habakkuk when God spoke. And in Habakkuk 3 and verse 16, the prophet writes and he says, when I heard 
my body trembled. My lips quivered at the voice. Rottenness entered my bones, and I trembled in myself. If you sit down at the table in the morning to have your morning devotions, your quiet time with God, and all of a sudden you look up and on the other side of the table, God Almighty himself is sitting there. What would you do? I heard a man one time, he said, you know, if I saw the Lord face to face, I'd give him a high five. I don't think we'd be giving him a high five. I think we would be trembling in his holy presence. And here's the thing that actually happens. When you meet God, when you're having your time with the Lord, he is sitting at the table with you. And he is doing so in his word. The word of God is there. God reveals himself in creation as we saw in the first verse of Isaiah 66, but God reveals himself even more powerfully in his written word. What a privilege it is to open the Bible and realize that it is God himself who is speaking to us in this blessed book. Now, one of the marks of revival that you can see in Scripture and also through historical counts of revival, is that whenever revival takes place, there is a heightened sensitivity to the Word of God. Back in February of 2023, a powerful move of God swept across the Fruitland campus for a period of about 48 hours uh, students were meeting around the clock in the chapel. This was at the very same time that the revival was taking place in Asbury uh, over in Kentucky. The same thing was happening in several other uh, college campuses across the nation. And Lisa and I had the privilege of being there in that revival and seeing the powerful move of God that swept our campus. And out of that revival, the thing that stands out to me, the thing that I will never forget as long as I live, is what happened when students, one by one, not prompted by any person, but only prompted by the Holy Spirit of God, they would walk to the front of the chapel where a microphone was set up they would open their Bibles and read Scripture. And they would read a passage from the Bible without making any comment about it whatsoever, just the pure, straight Word of God. And the Holy Spirit fell upon that place in such power that the altar was full of people. Every time Scripture was read, there was another group of people that would come to the altar praying and crying out to God and begging for His forgiveness and for His cleansing. Lisa and I sat there side by side hearing words of God that we had read many, many times before. And when those students read the Scripture, there was such a heightened sensitivity even in us to the Word of God that it was just like we were hearing the Scriptures for the very first time. That was the Holy Spirit moving. We literally spent time together trembling before the Word of God. Even to this day, there are tear stains on the carpet around the altar at Fruitland Baptist Bible College in the chapel because of those students who prayed and trembled in the presence of God. Are you one of those who trembles at the Word, at God's Word? Charles Spurgeon talked about those who tremble at the searching power of the Word of God. And he says this, 
to, he said this to his congregation. Do you ever come into this place and sit down in a pew and say, Lord, grant that thy word may search me and try me, that I may not be deceived. Certain people must always have sweets and comforts, but God's wise children do not wish for these in undue measure. Daily bread we ask for, not daily sugar. When you tremble at God's word, it'll make a difference in your life in several ways. Number one, it'll make a difference in how you receive the word. Again, another Puritan, a Puritan pastor, Jeremiah Burroughs, he said that those who hear God's word with a trembling heart are most likely of all men and women to understand the mind of God and to understand God's counsel revealed in his word. On the other hand, those who are rich in their own thoughts and understandings are sent away empty, trembling at the word. It'll make a difference in how you receive the word. Uh, secondly, it'll make a difference in how you live the Christian life. Cotton Mather wrote of a fellow uh, uh, believer and said that the character of his daily life was a trembling walk with God. Think about the words of Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 and 13, where the scripture says to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. With fear and trembling and then he adds for it is God who works in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure uh, Paul is writing there not saying that we work for salvation but we work because of salvation and because of what God has worked in us we work that out as we live the Christian life and we do it with fear and with trembling it is so serious. And then another aspect of trembling is that if you are a preacher like I am and Pastor Tim and Jim Brackett and perhaps others here tonight, if you're a teacher of God's Word in a Sunday school class or a small group or a discipleship group, a trembling heart will make all the difference in how you preach and how you teach the Word of God. I want you to listen to this quote from A.W. Tozer. He says, I've heard all kinds of preachers. I've heard the ignorant boaster. I've heard the dry, dull ones. I've heard the eloquent ones. But the ones that have helped me most were the ones that were awestruck in the presence of the God about whom they spoke. They might have a sense of humor, they might be jovial, but when they talked about God, another tone came into their voice altogether. This was something else, something wonderful. I believe we ought to have again the old biblical concept of God which makes, uh, which makes God awful and makes men lie face down and cry, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. And he says that would do more for the church than everything or anything else. I started off tonight saying this was going to be a heavy message because it deals with our hearts. It deals with what we bring before the Lord. You know, I have a sense of humor that you've not observed at all tonight, but it's there, and you'll probably hear some of it as we go into the rest of the week. I, I'm, uh, not every message will be as heavy as this particular message is tonight, 
but it's where revival continues. And God put this on my heart tonight to share it with you. And I want to conclude with this verse, also in the book of Isaiah, chapter 57 and verse 15. Oh, I'm so glad that this is in the Word of God. Isaiah 57, verse 15. For thus says the high and lofty one who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. Now listen. I dwell in the high and holy place with him who has a contrite and humble spirit. Did you catch that? God says, I dwell in the high and holy place with him who has a contrite and an humble spirit. When you realize this, when God is looking in your direction and you come before him with a broken, contrite spirit and a trembling heart, you can become a high and holy place where God dwells. That's where he dwells, with people like that. Now, he says to dwell with him who has a contrite and humble spirit. Now, get this. Notice the word revival, the word revive. Why does he dwell with him who has a contrite and humble spirit? Here's the answer. To revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. And so when we come before God like that and our heart becomes a high and a holy place where God dwells, when that happens, revival occurs in our lives and all of a sudden poverty in spirit is replaced by great spiritual riches. And mourning over sin is replaced by joy unspeakable and full of glory. And we're going to experience some of that here this week. There's no doubt about that. And trembling before God results in the fact that you never have to tremble before man. You never have to tremble before a government that is hostile to your faith. Or before a person that wants to persecute you because of your belief. If you have trembled before the holy God of this universe, you never have to tremble before any other person that you stand before. God is looking your way. How will you respond? Will you let your heart become a high and holy place where God dwells. We're going to give an invitation in a moment, and as we prepare for that tonight, I want to just read one little paragraph of a prayer of a Puritan by the name of Philip Doddridge. I love how the Puritans were so honest before God in their praying. They didn't pray those little prayers, now I lay me down to sleep. They didn't pray prayers to be heard and seen of men. They poured their hearts out before God. And a part of this prayer, this man of God prays, and he says, Oh, blessed God, if there is any sin yet lurking in my soul, anything I have not sincerely renounced, show me and tear it out of my heart even if it has shot its roots ever so deep and wrapped them all around so that every nerve would be pained by the separation, tear it away, Lord, by your graciously severe hand. Some of you have been doing that. You've been tracking with me in this message tonight because this is where you are. This is where your heart is before the Lord. And that's why God is working in your life and he's ready to go to work. I thank God for the response that I heard about in the message to the message this morning and the altar that was filled 
with people, but I want to plead with you tonight, don't be left out. Don't be one of those who has a hard heart before the Lord or a heart that's calloused and, and, and refuses to submit unto the Lord and to go by his plan and his recipe for revival. Don't miss out on this. God is looking upon us. What does he see? What will we bring to him? And if we bring that humble, contrite spirit, and a trembling heart. God is going to go to work in an amazing way to bring revival in our lives. Let's pray together as we prepare for the invitation hymn. Heavenly Father, I pray tonight in Jesus' name that you will reach out to every one of us where we are. And I pray, Father, that you would draw us unto you wherever we are at in our walk with you. May we make a choice to walk closer with you than we've ever been before. If there is yet hidden sin in our hearts that needs to be plucked out, I pray, Father, that we will allow you to do that tonight and that we would be set free from things that have held us in bondage and things that have tripped us up and, and, and really been detrimental to our spiritual relationship with you. Oh God, help every one of us to walk out of this building in a few moments tonight with hearts that are humble, with a contrite spirit, and with a heart that trembles before you. Father, whatever the work is that you need to do in us tonight, help us to bring it unto you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, I'm going to ask that Pastor Tim be here at the front to guide and direct in this time of invitation this evening. We'll sing a hymn of invitation. The altar is open tonight. Let the Holy Spirit work and move in your life. Let's all stand together as we sing the hymn of invitation tonight.
David, thank you so much for opening the word. Have you thought about trembling lately? When you open up your word in the morning, when you open up the scriptures, God is there to speak. A holy reverence, a humble heart, a contrite spirit, realizing who we're talking to, the one true God. He's always, he's always up to good in the lives of his people. You're here tonight to hear this word so that he can continue that good work that he has for you and in you. So uh, continue to pray for David as he opens the word and pray for all of us to be responsive to what we've heard. So when God looks our way, he sees one that is eager and willing to respond in obedience and submission. There's no limit to what God can do with a group this size as we yield ourselves to him. Seek to live as everyday missionaries. Those divine appointments are there for each and every one of us. Let me pray for us. Father in heaven, help us, Lord, to take in, to meditate, and to ponder, to think upon this passage out of Isaiah that tells us what you're looking for, that tells us how to go deeper with you, that tells us how to experience you in your fullness, and how to... Fulfill your plans and purposes for us, Lord. So, Father, I thank you for the many hearts tonight that have been receptive. And for the word that will bear fruit, it will take root and it will bring transformation. So, Lord, continue to do that good work in us as we seek to abide in you and walk with you and obey you. Bless your servant. Give him a good night of rest. Him and his wife, safe trip home. And, Lord, help us. Uh, Lord, continue to seek you and to hunger and thirst for you. Uh, Lord, not just the remaining days of these services, Lord, but for the remaining days that you allow us to live. You're an awesome God. We thank you tonight. Hallowed be thy name. And all of God's people said, amen. Don't rush out of here yet. Let David get to the back door. Uh, there he's already back there. All right, head on back.